Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. My name is Richard Simons, and in this video, this is going to be my in-depth review on the BMW i4 M50. I've been really looking forward to getting my hands on this car, and lucky enough, unlike a lot of reviews out there, there's plenty out there, but I've been able to drive this car for a few days and a few hundred miles, so I've got to know it pretty well. All the things I like and all the things I don't like, I will certainly tell you about. I'm also very much used to driving electric cars and Teslas, so I'm not just going to be sort of blown away with the performance and forget everything else. I am very much used to a Tesla Model 3, which I've been driving a large part of the last two and a half years. So a good point of comparison. We often compare to the Teslas, but they do set the benchmarks in a lot of ways. So, but before we do that, you know, let me just point out, before I get accused of being a Tesla fanboy, I'm also a BMW M fan. Before getting into my electric cars, I had BMW M cars. I took my daughter home from hospital after being born in a BMW M5 that I own. So I'm a BMW M fan. We do also run BMW in the company. And so this is not gonna be a biased opinion at all. And in fact, back in November, I even ordered one of these for myself. That's how much I've actually been looking forward to getting my hands on this car. So am I pleased? Am I disappointed? Will I keep my order? I'm going to tell you everything now about the i4 M50 that I've managed to find in the last few days. Okay, so before we get into it, what exactly do we have here? This is the full beans, the i4 M50 version. There is a non-M version available as well, two-wheel drive, but this is four-wheel drive with 544 brake horsepower. It has 80 kilowatt hours of usable battery capacity, and it starts at about 64 and a half thousand pounds, something like that. But by the time you add a comfort pack, a visibility pack, and a technology pack, all of which I think are fairly essential, it pushes this car, as we see it now, and as per the one I've ordered, to about £73,000. So it does start getting quite expensive. Let's compare some of those numbers to the Tesla Model 3. So this is £60,000. The only extras to this really are a colour and if you want the full self-driving package, but it does come with an autopilot system standard. And this is £60,000 new with a slightly smaller battery, but not by much. Got about 77 usable out of an 82 kilowatt hour pack. So the Tesla Model 3 is a bit cheaper with the same kind of option spec. It is a bit quicker, 0 to 63.1, 0 to 63.8, 3.9, something like that. Um, so it's quicker, it's cheaper, and it has a better standard spec. However, let's not be too distracted by that. Let me tell you what I think about this car, this Aventurian Red Metallic. I thought looks quite nice in the pictures, but in the flesh, I have to say, not my personal taste. I haven't warmed to it. It just looks a bit brown a lot of the time when it's dirty and dull as it is now. And this front grille, I was hoping I would kind of come to warm to this and like it, but no, I haven't. I just don't like this BMW design language. I can't get used to it and it's not my favorite thing. But anyway, let's move on with the rest of it. This does have the laser headlights and they're Bloody brilliant, absolutely amazing. The best headlights I've had on any car so far, bar none. In fact, we'll see if we can put together some clips and even make a separate video about this. These front air scoops do actually go through and come out here, which probably aids airflow. But other than that, the front does look pretty much like any other four series Grand Coupe, which is of course what this car is based on. I think this is part of the problem with some of the elements of this car is that it's not been designed from the ground up as an electric car. There's also versions of this with engines in, combustions engine. And that's why there's a massive bonnet here. What's in that bonnet? What's under there? Well, let's have a look. Well, lots of stuff, but nothing you can use. There's no front storage space at all. So you've got a huge bonnet, a long car. I can see the motor, I can see some wiring, but there's not even any cable storage or anything you can use under here. And you compare that to the Tesla, the much smaller car, and it's actually got some really useful storage space in the front here. So as we come down the side, this one's got the 20 inch wheels with it. It doesn't have the aggression of a BMW M car of the combustion version, like an M3. It doesn't have the kind of bonnet scoops. It doesn't have the vents here. It doesn't have the flared arches. We've got very similar or the same wing mirrors. Uh, but as we come, especially towards the back, it just doesn't have the haunch here. It has this little strip stuck on top of the normal kind of four series bodywork. Yep, 285, 30R20 tires on the back are big and wide but it just doesn't have the aggression when it's sat next to a BMW M car. So it sits quite high up as well. So I kind of would have preferred a slightly more aggressive stance to it, to bring it to the you know, M badge standard. But nonetheless, you know, it looks pretty sharp and smooth. I think it just looks a bit like the other 4 Series Grand Coupe. It could be a 420D with an M Sport body kit. And this great big square charging flap, which by the way, has a little nozzle in here for putting the petrol cap, straight from the other car as well. So, yep, for me, it's okay. It looks quite sharp. I think this color isn't doing any favors for me personally. I've ordered mine in Brooklyn Gray. If you've ordered one of these, what color would you choose? 
Let me know in the comments below. Let's look at the back. Sorry with how dirty I've made it. I've been putting as many miles in this car as I can. Sorry, BMW. Okay, so down here, we've got some quite kind of big diffusers here where you'd probably expect some exhaust if it was an M combustion car. Uh, some black plastic here. Other than that, it looks fairly subdued. Even the spoiler is fairly subtle. And then we've got the M50 badge here. But this is one of the biggest reasons why I would want to change from a Model 3 to an i4 and that's because it's a hatchback and it's not a saloon vastly more practical for me uh, as a parent and this is, gives a good open boot space so i really like this and it's one of the key driving factors for me personally to consider the change and the second reason why i consider a change from the model 3 much as i like it it has a fairly firm suspension setup which works well gives it that sharpness but when you're just on the long drives like i do quite a lot it just becomes a little bit niggly and a little bit tiring. It's just a little bit firm. There's no adaptive dampen or option to soften it off. Whereas the i4 does, it has springs at the front, but it has air suspension at the back and it has adaptive damping. So you've got a sport mode and then you've got a nice soft, comfortable mode for the long distance journeys. Okay, so in here is very BMW in that it's quite smart. It seems to be well finished. I'll get into some of the nitty gritties about what I do and don't like in a minute. But in here would feel very familiar to any BMW 3, 4 or 5 series owner. The main difference really is they've changed this front binnacle to this one large curved screen in front of you here. But other than that, it's all very much the same. In the back, well, it suffers that common trait with uh, battery cars in that the seat and the floor are quite close together. So my knees are up a bit. There isn't enough room under the seat with my driving position to get my feet under. So I'm okay for a little bit. My head is on the ceiling, just touching now. I'm six foot tall, so it's okay, but I wouldn't want to spend hours and hours in here. And then the main problem really is it suffers the common trait of having a transmission tunnel down here, it, which it doesn't need. This is probably a hollow box now, um, but it has that because other cars need a drive shaft to go through here and it just impedes into space. And that's just one of the compromises when you don't have a dedicated EV platform. We've been, uh, what are we in? <laughs> it really is quite different from the Tesla Model 3 here. This is much lower dashboard, bigger windscreen, more slow. I can see much better forwards. I can see, even see the road almost in front of the car there. It's really quite a different feeling. It's much more open here. And of course, just more minimal. There's less different materials, but I wouldn't say it feels of any lesser quality. It just is more minimal and far more open, which you may prefer, you may not prefer. So as I get into the back of the Model 3, it's much more airy. We've got a glass roof as standard. You can't get an open sunroof like you can with a BMW, but it's got a glass roof as standard, so it's nice and light. It feels more open here. I've still got slightly high knees, like is my common complaint. And again, with the seat in my driving position, I can't really get my feet underneath, but we've got this big flat open floor so I can actually spread out a little bit better. And it's nice. So I'd say there's actually a bit more room in the back of this, although my knees are a little bit folded up. I have to say it's my common complaint with these. However, where this does lose out a little bit to the BMW is we've got a fold down armrest here, but the BMW can actually fold the whole center seat down so you can have two adults and the whole center section down and put a big load through and that is good perfect so i found a box to give you an example you've got four adults in the car but you want to carry this box can't really do it in the tesla it really would be a squeeze to have two adults on one side of the back seat on the tesla but in the bmw four adults and a long box comfortably what if you have a box this size that you cannot get in a Tesla, but you can just about in the BMW, as long as you remove the parcel shelf there and there. So I've got two little boxes in there. I can get one of them in the front and then two bigger boxes in the boot without folding the seats. And these just about go in nicely. Perfect. Let's see how that compares in the BMW. <laughs> these are super heavy, 80 kilograms each. One. The BMW is not as wide, is it? Nowhere near fitting that in. Let's try this way. There we go. There's nothing I can use under the floor there. And I couldn't go that way either. Okay, let's take that out. Let's not leave that behind. I don't think you could do it. So as long as you take out the two parcel shelves of the i4, you can still get the same 
two big boxes, two smaller boxes in the Model 3, and you can get this one bigger box, which you can't get in the Model 3. So the i4 does take practicality, but you have to be amazed by how big the boot is on the Model 3, and then you've got the big underfloor storage, and then you've got the big frunk as well. And here's a test of Model S by comparison, and that easily fits those four boxes without even taking the parcel shelf out and without even using the even bigger underfloor storage there or any front space. So both are definitely smaller than a Tesla Model S. Under the boot floor in the BMW, there is a little bit of storage, but most of it is taken up by the Harman Cub Garden subwoofer. And then you can get a little bag like this, which is, which is, oh, a tire pump. Compare that to a Model 3, much bigger underfloor storage there. Let's talk about the center console here because again, this is where the BMW is compromised, I'm afraid, because I guess normally there's a gearbox under here. God knows what's under there now, but it means that this whole center console is A, quite wide, so I can't really get my legs to opening up like I can in the Tesla. And then in here we've got, although one mobile wireless charger, it's kind of right back at this section here. And then there's two drinks holders here, but right next to that is an open USB and a 12 volt socket. So any drink spill would kind of go straight into those sockets. And that might have happened a little bit at BMW. I hope it still works. Got hot chocolate all over it from McDonald's. But you shouldn't have put it there. This end is very conventional. I do like having an iDrive to just twist this around and control on the screen so you don't have to lean forward and prod on a screen whilst you're driving. That would apply to the tester as well. But then when you come back here, we've got just a short, uh, small cubby storage there because again, I presume normally this is designed for cars with gearboxes and prop shafts and things like that. So it's a compromise as a result. And that's where it suffers a little bit. The center console of the Tesla, I vastly prefer. It's narrower, so it feels wider here. We've got two wireless phone chargers, so it's very easy for me to put my phone there and a passenger charge their phone as well. We've got a big storage compartment down here, two convenient cup holders, a nicely placed armrest, and then a huge storage compartment under here. What it does have though is a very nice sensible cuff. <laughs> Let me try and summarize quickly how they compare to drive and what do I think of this i4. Well, it's got loads of power, we know that, but what it does have, and I will criticize, is that when you put your foot down like that, you then get this slight delay in the power delivery. It's not as throttle responsive as the Tesla. The steering is not as responsive either. You've got this actually slightly vague center section. So on a country road, you can place it, it doesn't roll. It is very accurate, but it's not quite as precise as the Tesla. It's not as sort of darty or flighty. It doesn't feel as nimble. And it isn't, it's over 400 kilograms heavier and it feels it from the moment you get in the car, it just feels bigger and heavier and it feels actually like a BMW 5 series to drive. What it does mean though, is that on a long journey and one of the days I had was quite a long day of a few hundred miles of driving, it was very comfortable. And by the end of that day, I appreciated that refinement and that comfort that it did have. It did have that BMW thing of supreme long distance, high speed comfort, very much an autobahn car. The Model 3 has a smaller steering wheel, far more nimble, like a fly changing direction, this thing. It's got a much faster steering rack, and straight away it's much more darty, it's agile, it does feel that it is 400 kilograms lighter, and the throttle's instantly responsive, so it feels actually the quicker car most of the time, and certainly the more agile for smaller country roads. Where the Model 3 does fall apart a little bit is that you come from having fun on a track or on a small country road onto a long motorway cruise and there is no adaptive suspension of any kind. So that firmer suspension, you still feel it when you're on the long distance cruise. So for long distance cruising, the BMW has that card, but for sheer kind of fun and agility and I think on track, the Tesla would take it. So whilst the BMW has the benefit of being able to switch between a comfort and eco mode and sport mode very easily down here, and you can even turn the traction off, Personally, I would have liked to have seen a bit more of a transformation when you go to sport. I'd like to have felt it become a bit more hardcore straight away, more aggressive. It's still kind of, actually, if you want to push on the country road a bit soft, and it still has a slightly kind of vague center section of the steering. Look, it's not bad at all, but I would like for it to wear the M badge to have been a bit more aggressive. And what I would say is, when you do push on a little bit, it feels much more like 
really a front wheel drive car. The more the power feels like it's on the front. So it scrabbles for grip at the front and actually torque steers a little bit. So you put your foot down on an undulating country lane like we have here and your, the steering wheel is actually fighting you from the front not from the back and for me a BMW M car is about a little bit leery at the back you don't want to you know you want to consider if, if you can put your foot down you have to do a little bit of that with this because it's extremely powerful but it kind of feels like a powerful front wheel drive car not as much rear wheel drive as I personally would like from an M car. This has got the Harman Kardon sound system and that big sub in the boot there which takes up loads of space and it's a very good sound system it's got nice depth to it it's really good my colleague though, who's very much into his music, says that the Tesla Model 3 is better, has a slightly richer sound system. So good though this is, he prefers the Tesla. What about efficiency, charging speed, real world range? Well, we've just filmed another video where we compare the two cars side by side. And in fact, we added a Porsche Taycan into the mix there as well, because I think this car does sit kind of in between a Model 3 and a Taycan really. Um, and so we'll tell you there, but real world range from this car it is colder at the moment and it's about 200 miles. I've actually had it less than 200 miles, uh, but I think in the summer it could be up to about 250 miles of real world range. I don't think you're gonna get above 250 miles unless you're really trying hard. So we'll wait to see. Peak charging speed, BMW claimed 200 kilowatts on this. Uh, Tesla claimed 250 kilowatts on the Model 3. How do they compare? We have to check out our other video. Check in our other videos, or we'll try and add a description in the link below. Maybe even put a link in the screen here, somewhere top. You don't have the option for a tow bar on a Model 3 Performance, but on this you can. This one doesn't, but you can have one. Both on 20 inch wheels, two 35 20s, two 55 35 20s. But which wheels do you prefer? Do you prefer the 20 inch Uber Turbine alloys, or do you prefer these BMW 20 inch wheels with diamond cut fascia? Let me know in the comments below. The Tesla doesn't have any lights around the door handles, so at night time you can't see them and you're kind of prodding around like this or getting your phone out. The i4 does however have handle lights and puddle lights, although I would say that it's kind of, your hands could kind of slip off that bit. It's kind of weird. Nice door closure though. The Tesla native navigation, including finding and planning charging, is far better. Plus of course you've got the Tesla supercharger network all around Europe. Yes, there's some talk about some of those locations being op open to all cars, which would be easier. The trouble I found with the BMW was that um, it didn't even know about the massive rugby services stop with 350 kilowatt charges and was trying to direct me to a 50 kilowatt down charger down the road. So the Tesla for the supercharger network and the ease of route planning and navigation is far better. Tesla also has Netflix, YouTube, Twitch, karaoke, arcade games, toys, enough to keep you entertained. With the Tesla it's also easy to leave the climate running when you're out of the car and you also have dog mode and even camping mode. So with the technology pack, I think it is, the i4 has a kind of dash recording system using the cameras built into the car. The Tesla also has that. It also has sentry mode for recording around the car when the car's parked. And you can view that in the car here when you get back to it, it'll tell you alerts. But the Tesla, I can even view the cameras from the car when I'm not even around it. I can be anywhere in the world and view the cameras on my car. I can even press this button here, talk to it, and that comes out on the car. And if you're going to get serious, the Tesla Model 3 Performance even has track mode, which you can even configure. And it's actually really, really good. You can, you can choose if you want bias towards rear wheel drive handling, all the way rear wheel drive, front wheel drive. You can choose exactly how much stability control you want, how much regen braking you have. The cooling of the battery works brilliantly, so you can run lap after lap after lap. You've got a G meter here. It can save the footage from each lap on your dash cam as well, so it can record your laps for you. And if you set the start finish time, which it will prompt you to do, start finish line, sorry, it will even record your lap times automatically for you as well. It's pretty good, isn't it? To drive on the track, it is really, really good. And you can even upgrade brake pads if you want to get serious about it and suspension. There's a lot of configurations and customization available for the Model 3 for hardcore track driving now, and it is a very fast lapping car. The BMW headlights might be far superior on the road, but it doesn't do a light show like this. And these headlights, although they're not dynamic matrix, not yet at least, that might well follow, but these can even project the word Tesla onto a wall when it's doing this display right now. And that is pretty clever, huh? All Tesla Model 3s in the UK at the moment have double laminated front windows as standard. I don't have these on this BMW. It does make it nice and quiet. You hear it when the cars come past you kind of on the other side of the road. It does seem a bit quieter, but one of the main benefits really is for thermal management. Keeps the heat in, 
And you can feel it when you're near the glass on a really cold day. It keeps the heating better and therefore you need less energy to keep the cabin warm. It makes all the sense in the world. It's one of the reasons why the Tesla is the more efficient car when it comes to energy consumption. This one doesn't have it, solid metal roof, but you can get an opening sunroof option on this car. And that option you don't have with the Tesla. It has the glass roof as standard, which is nice, but you can't open it. Well, with a hammer, <laughs> one way. With this configuration, this car has the BMW version of the Tesla autopilot, so radar cruise, lane keeping. And I have to say, it works really well, no problem at all. This one's got the head up display and you can actually configure a few bits with visibility in that display there. Kind of nice to have. I'm not as bothered about head up display as some people really want to see that on the Tesla. Wouldn't do any harm to see it on the Tesla. Everyone gets upset about it just having the one screen in the middle and the speedos in the middle. And people say you have to keep looking around like this to see your speed. In reality with a BMW, I can see the speed there and I can see the speed here. In the Tesla, the speed is just there. I don't think it's an issue, but I guess the head up display option could be a nice to have. It's okay, it works quite well in here. With this car, you can adjust the regen braking by moving this to the left, and then you've got the kind of one pedal driving thing, or you can bring it over and it's got an adaptive regen. So if there's nothing in front of you, it just defaults to uh, sort of coasting mode. But if there's a vehicle slower in front of you, or even if you're entering a lower speed limit area, it seems to then apply the regen and slows down. And I actually quite like having those two versions and it works. I'd like to see some paddles though. The Tesla doesn't have them either, but I would like, and the other cars I have with paddles for regen adjustment, I think are really good. And it'd be nice to see that on here, to be honest. And of course, it's BMW's wireless Apple CarPlay, and it works really well. Now, the Tesla doesn't have the option for CarPlay. Many argue you don't really need it. And I do agree with that to quite a lot. Uh, of extent because its native system is very good. The BMW native navigation uh, infotainment system I think looks pretty crude, looks pretty basic, looks pretty out of date. However, with Apple CarPlay, it's very, very good. And what I do like is that it even integrates with the iDrive controller. So I can actually use this iDrive controller to move my way around the screen without having to reach and trying to press the touch screen whilst you're driving and going over bumps. So I think that's excellent. The other thing I would highlight with this as well is that this navigation, if you use your CarPlay navigation, in this case, Apple navigation, it can also merge that mapping into the driver's display here and also brings up your instructions onto the head up display. And a lot of cars are driven with wireless Apple CarPlay, including <coughs> Porsche Taycan. It works well on here, but it doesn't then utilize any of this screen for navigation like it would if you use the native system. So it's a mixed bag. I really like how that integrates. I like having the iDrive controller to operate all this, uh, whether it's the mapping or mixed cloud or any of that stuff, I think that's brilliant. However, the native system isn't very good at all, I don't think. So let's go to home and let's have a look at this map in here. This is the BMW native map in here and it's pretty crude. This looks like the navigation on our BMW i3, which is many years old by comparison. So these seats are really comfortable, easy to get loads of adjustment in these. I do have thigh support, although it's a manual adjustment there, but that's okay, I can live with that. Don't move it too much. The steering wheels uh, feels nice, it's bigger than the Tesla. I'm glad they avoided haptic buttons on here, that they're actual buttons. These little strips here are actually yellow lights that light up when you're on the autopilot system if you're not holding the steering wheel. And then this one's got the heated steering wheel, which puts the button there, which I don't really like that. That should be an M button or something like that, so it goes into its wild mode. Uh, I'd rather they hidden the heated steering wheel button somewhere else, basically. I do like having this dimmer switch down here so you can very quickly brighten or dim the uh, screens and the head-up display at night, so that's good. Here, I can do some adjustment with the displays, so I can choose some of the content and layout in here which is okay, but I'd like to see more because I basically don't really like these graphics. And although I can change those graphics a little bit, it's still not really that good and I don't really like this. But it's an okay place to be. I quite like still having just manual air vents and the trim here is nice. I'll tell you one little thing that actually I have spotted a number of times and that does bug me. We have blanks where there should be buttons if this was a left-hand drive car. But rather than just changing this trim, we've got blank panels. And 
having blank panels is a bit of a bugbear of mine in cars. I don't really like it. It feels like you're missing out on something. One of my main gripes really is that this could be a 320D and it would probably feel pretty similar. Yes, you can have some snazzy carbon bits, which I've also ordered, but in reality, being in a car that's half the price of this would feel the same. I think really. I do like these seat belts, that's nice. So there is my opinion after a few days with the i4 M50. Often these reviews sound a bit negative because I'm pointing out the things I don't like and again it's always hard to take that in context, I don't want to sound like a whinging git. In summary, I would say I like it, it's a good car, I'm just not blown away by it and I think I think if I try and round this up and I'll be as quick as I can, I think what I want to say is it's, it's good, but it's too, it, there's quite a few compromises because it shares the chassis and the platform and everything with a normal you know, combustion BMW. And therefore it has a long bonnet with nothing underneath it. And you know, the console isn't kind of ideal and brilliant. So it has a lot of good qualities. It's a much more comfortable car. It doesn't have much more space inside, but with a hatchback is more practical and you can have a tow bar. If you're doing lots of motorway driving, it is the more comfortable car. The Tesla is a sharper weapon, but you can't put it in the comfort mode on those kind of long motorway drives. So you need to make sure you're happy with the comfort of that. But in terms of efficiency, charging network, that's far easier. This is more difficult in that regard. So I sort of feel a bit underwhelmed if that makes sense. So there's a lot of pros, but there's a few cons to it. And in case anyone was doubting, this here is my order form for the one I ordered a few weeks and months ago. Will I keep that order? I think I will for the minute. I, I see how I feel and I see what I think I need at the time because I think it depends what suits you. If you're doing lots of longer journeys and you want the comfort, then that is a more comfortable vehicle to have for that but it comes at a price with the options you need. Oh, those laser headlights, they're really good. So it just has a few things that are really good, but it depends what developments we have with the Tesla between now and then as well, and what I need at times. So I think I'll leave it. I just wanted this to be a bit more M. I think when it went, goes to sport mode, I just want it to be a bit more aggressive with its balance and feel, not just its sheer power, but just more aggressive looking, more M, a bit more wild and harder to tame. And it isn't that. It's very fast and straight line. I know a lot of reviewers have gone, crikey, this is a real M car, this is brilliant. But for me, it actually didn't capture the feel of my previous M's. And I think that's what I was hoping for. That's what I haven't got. And that's why in some regards, I'm a bit disappointed with it. But it's hard to deny that it is an accomplished car. It's horses for courses. It will suit some people better. But for a lot of people, the Model 3 will be better suited for them as well. So. Let's finish it up. I hope that's been useful. Do check out our other video of this car, comparing it side by side for efficiency and charging speed. And then we hope to repeat some of that a bit later on in the year, in the summer when it's a bit warmer, which makes a big difference. Plus, what we do find of electric cars is that software updates can even improve efficiency, charging speed capability. So this may well be receiving some upgrades before our UK customer deliveries begin a bit later this year. So for now, that's it for me. It's good, but it depends what you want. Thank you for watching. Stay subscribed, hit the like button, and I'd like to hear your feedback and comments below. Before you do that, make sure you've heard all the bits I said all the way through while I'm saying this is a good balanced review, and I'm not just a Tesla fanboy. This is balanced and real world. Thank you for watching.